Okay, gang. This next section, section 4.6, it's actually two parts to it. The first is called differentials, the, the concept of differentials. And the second is uh, linear approximations, which we'll talk about in the next video. Okay. But for now, I want to talk about differentials. Differentials, loosely put, are very, very tiny quantities. Okay. They are very, very useful, as we'll see. And as it turns out, they're still used in physics and engineering today. Okay. Differentials. Differentials are extremely small quantities, and they're symbolized by expressions such as this, okay, dx or du, okay? So this means a very, very tiny amount of x, a very, very tiny amount of u, okay? Some books refer to these as infinitesimals, okay? Something that is infinitesimally small, we say. Not so small that it's actually equal to zero, but too small, you, you can't see what a microscope will say, okay? So the differential of x, the differential of u, the differential of something, okay? They're called very, very tiny quantities, okay? Here's an example, okay? Let's say you've got some function, y equals f of x, And we'll put some color on there. Okay. Now, to the untrained eye, that looks like a little red dot. We know better. Okay. It's practically a segment. Oh, what's he talking about? Well, let's, let's do this. Let's put a microscope around this part right here. I'm going to magnify it over here. Okay. Okay, so this, think of this right here. This is the magnification of that little portion right there on the curve, okay? It's practically a segment gang. And I would like to know, what is the slope of that segment? Well, because it's so small, we have to think in terms of what we say called differentials, right? What is slope? Slope is the rise over the run. Well, according to this figure right here, I can figure rise over run this way. I just put that little triangle in there. This is a very, very tiny horizontal amount. Horizontally speaking, why don't we call that dx? Okay. Well, what about the rise? Right? The y, the, that's the y coordinate up and down, right? The rise. That is also a very, very tiny amount, a differential amount. Why don't we call that dy? So what is the slope of that little red line right there? The rise over the run. Okay, which we've all seen this before, right? We know what that is. That's, that's, that's just one of the symbols for the derivative of a function. And it means slope of a tangent line, rate of change, rise over the run, all that stuff that we've been talking about all this time, okay? This, we refer to this as the ratio of two differentials, okay? This, in fact, is how they used to do calculus before the concept of limits. So, for example, in the time of Newton and Leibniz, okay? This is actually how they did derivatives. Ratios of differentials. Now, of course, gang, take this back over to here, right? And you get that, that's where, that's where you get that idea of slope of a tangent line, right? Slope of a tangent line. This thing right here, right over here. In fact, let's do this. If I superimpose another, let me get another color. Suppose I superimpose a blue line right over top of that red line, okay? Now, it kind of coincides with the black curve as well. Take that whole thing, bring it back right over here, okay? And notice that that blue line right there is right here. Huh, looks like a tangent line, go figure, okay? Again, this is the idea of differentials, okay? How does that fit in with anything that we've been talking about today? What's the ratio of differentials got to do with anything? Well, to put it in a little bit more context, let's use a very specific example instead of a, gen a generic one like this. Let's say that we had 
the basic squaring function. Okay, the basic squaring function. Again, can we agree to this? If you increase the value of x by a very tiny amount, then y should increase as well. Okay, so change this a little bit. We would expect a change in the y as well. I mean, look, the one depends on the other. They're connected by an equal sign, right? So can we say this? Okay, change x by a very, very tiny amount say dx, right? A differential amount, an infinitesimal amount. That little change on the right-hand side will cause a change on the right, on the left-hand side. Okay? Expand this. Expand this. Okay? What do you think of that? <laughs> All right, now, here's, here's the, how, how the thinking goes, gang. dx is an extremely small amount. Remember, that's how we defined differential. We said a very tiny, tiny amount of x. So that's pretty small. But if you take that same level of smallness, for lack of better words, and you square it, it's going to get even smaller. Hey, try it with a number. right? You take one half, which isn't really that small. But if you take the number one half and square it, you get back one fourth, which is small. Okay? So over here, you've got a very, very tiny quantity, and you're raising it to a power that's going to make it even tinier still. In fact, gang, the, we can say, let's argue that this term right here is negligible. It adds no appreciable amount to the sum of these two terms. And so maybe we just disregard it. It adds no appreciable amount. Okay? So now we've got y plus dy here is equal to these two terms on the right-hand side. Well, y is the same as x squared. Okay, see this right here, gang? See that y? It's the same thing as x squared. But you've got an x squared on the other side as well. So you have an x squared here and an x squared there. They will cancel from both sides. Okay? Now, take this equation. Divide both sides by the differential of x. Okay, divide out both, both sides by dx. I'll, write the, I'll put it right here. Okay, so dy over dx, the ratio of the two differentials is equal to the 2x over here. And so, of course, we knew that, right? But by the power rule that we learned back in, what was that, section 3.2, I think it was, right? The derivative of x squared is 2x. So that's not very surprising, right? But remember, the way that we defined derivatives at the time, we used limits, right? Remember the seven limit formulas that we th talked about? We had a whole table of them, okay? So why were those necessary? Well, a lot of reasons, but let's, let's, let's go back to this right here. Mathematicians are going to have a very hard time with dropping this quantity right here, okay? Is this quantity exactly zero? No. So why are we allowed to drop it? We're just using logic. It's a very tiny quantity raised to another power, raised to, right, your square in a tiny number gets even tinier still. So we disregard it because we say it adds no appreciable amount. It's a negligible amount to the sum of these two right here. So we can just disregard it. But again, the problem is this. How small is small enough? And who gets to decide? See, the early mathematicians, they had a hard time with this kind of thinking, right? And that's, that's where the whole business of limits, you know, evolved and the limits to, uh, that led to um, the difference quotient, the derivative, and all of that. But the early, but before that time, this was pretty common practice. The thinking was, is that we call these higher order differentials. We always say higher order differentials can be disregarded because they're so negligible okay now are you going to find this in most calculus books today no no because mathematicians they they this is they can't deal with this the problem for a lot of you is is that many of you are going to go on to study physics and engineering and gang that's still how physicists and engineers do calculus they use the concept of differentials okay look in any statics book dynamics um, physics and engineering and you're going to see these concepts exactly like i just said and they'll use words like higher order differentials can be disregarded, okay? And they're, they, they're speaking to you as if you know what they're talking about, okay? So it's important for us to see these kind of things. 
Let me give you another example. We'll do, um, let's do a sine function. So again, I'm going to apply that method of differentials to this, see how this turns out. We already know what the derivative of the sine is. We know that it's equal to the cosine. There's no surprise there. I'm going to use something else that we developed earlier on. I believe it was section 3.5. Remember this guy? Okay. Right, so this is uh, one of the three important trigonometric limits we discussed back in section 3.5. This, gang, if I take the limit symbol off of that equation, then I can't use an equal sign, but I can say this. Okay, it's a good approximation to one as long as the angle is very small, okay? We say this is a good approximation. The sine of x divided by x is approximately one as long as the angle is very, very small. Okay, one other thing. I'm going to multiply both sides by x. Okay, once again now, this says that the sine of an angle is essentially the angle itself, as long as the angle is very, very small. Gang, try it with your, with your calculator in radian mode. Take like the sine of 1 one hundredth, and you'll see that it's practically 1 one hundredth. Okay, all right, now back over to this, all right? I'm going to increase the sine's angle by a little bit. And we would expect a change in the left-hand side also by a little bit. It seems logical. Okay. All right, now, for this right here, I'm going to use the sum, one of the sum and difference formulas from our trigonometry days, your favorite. <laughs> Okay, and so we'll have this result right here. Okay, all right, so, so what are we gonna do with this? Well, first of all, the y right here, that y gang is the sine of x. Okay, so this y right here, okay. Over here on this side, the cosine of x, the cosine of a very small angle, Think of um, like the cosine of 0 0.0001 and so on and so on. As the angle gets smaller and the differential of x is pretty tiny, getting the cosine of a very tiny angle is about 1. Over here, look at this. The sine of a very small angle. Well, according to our work over here previously, we said that the sine of a very small angle is essentially the angle itself. So the sine of the angle dx is approximately dx. Okay, next. Notice I've got a sine here and a sine here. Subtract them from both sides. Okay, next, divide out both sides by the dx. Exactly as we would have expected. The ratio of the differentials dy to dx is equal to the cosine of x. Now early on, gang, we never said anything about this expression other than the fact that it was a differential operator. Remember we said um, the prime notation for derivative and the operator notation for derivative. We never said anything about that being a fraction. We didn't shy away from it either. It just wasn't the right time. But you should remember this and remember this always, gang, because it will always be true. The ratio of differentials always correctly represent derivatives. Okay, let me say that again because it's important. The ratio of differentials always correctly represent 
derivatives. And we will see that again in, in the rest of, the, of uh, Calculus 2 and Calculus 3. Okay, you'll see it again in your physics and your engineering. It's something that, it's a concept that doesn't go away, all right? Even after all these hundreds of years of calculus, we're still doing calculus using differentials, okay?